Compass. Our mission here is navigating people to God. We're one church in many locations, but we're so glad that you're joining us here in person at our North Richardson Hills campus or joining us online wherever you're watching from today. Well, we're going to continue in some more worship, but before that, why don't you turn and greet and welcome someone here today? holy, that you are good, you are mighty, you are worthy of our praise. Jesus, again, we ask for your, your presence to be with us. God, we glorify your name. Let's all sing this out together.
seated we want to continue our time of worship through this time of remembering how great a father we have in God how powerful and mighty he is but also how much he loves us that he would send his son Jesus to die in our behalf so that we can build our lives upon him that the sin that we brought into this world would not get in the way of him becoming our firm foundation. And what Jesus did on the cross to, to take on those sins so that we could have that everlasting life, we could have that gift of hope and grace is what we want to continue to worship and remember and give thanks for. And so if that's something that you believe in, that Jesus died for you and for me for our sins so that we could build and have a firm foundation upon the creator of the universe, and we would love for you to join us in this time of giving thanks through communion. So if you're watching with us online, uh, you can grab whatever you have. We would love for you to join us in this time. And if you're in person with us, you should have received a cup on your way in. And if you didn't, you can just raise your hand. Uh, one of our section hosts will bring you one. But in that cup is a, is a piece of bread, and that bread it represents the body that was broken and beaten for us on that cross. And then some, some juice represents the blood that was shed for us on that cross by our Savior, Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then I invite you to eat and drink those things, but more importantly, to take this time to reflect, to give thanks, and remember how great a God we serve, how great a Father we have in Him, and our Savior Jesus, what He did for each and every one of us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe of how much you love us, in awe of how much you've done, and continue to do in our lives, and that you would send your son Jesus on our behalf to, to die on a cross that we deserve for our sins, so that we could know and experience your everlasting life here on earth, but also one day with you in heaven. We give thanks for that gift and the love that you are giving us, the love that you are showing us that comes only from you. And then we get to experience that through what your son Jesus did. So Holy Spirit, as we, as we eat the bread that represents the body and drink the juice that represents the blood that was lost on the cross for each and every one of us, that you would fill us with the, the knowing comfort of just how much God loves us, how much our Father loves us. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. He would fill us with the presence, joy, gratitude for what has been given to us and that we would build our lives upon him, only him. We love you and it's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray. I'm Yoel Guy. I'm here at Dallas Christian College. I'm a student athlete, and I'd like to thank Compass for providing a scholarship for me. Grew up in, for four years, I was in South Sudan, and then we flew to Australia in about 
2004, and I came here to study, uh, it's called liberal studies. I had minors of psychology, business, communications, and also uh, Bible is also one of our minors to kind of pursue more into my faith and just understanding the, the, the Bible and everything. And then here at, at Dallas Christian, I'm doing sports management and looking to get into the grad program. In late fall, my scholarship had fell down and Compass had stepped in and helped me out, uh, provide a scholarship for me to help me pursue and continue on my studies. Being here at DCC has been a great privilege and getting the opportunity to get closer and build my faith with God has provided me with relationships and the opportunity to finish my, my classes here and, and finish up and provide back for my, for my city and my country, uh, country back home. I would personally like to thank just having Compass behind me and providing me with a, a scholarship. It's helped me so much with just moving on with my career itself, studying, building a closer relationship with God, and um, just, I'm just grateful for that, yeah. Thank y'all for supporting these young adults in their education and the many other amazing things that we get from Dallas Christian College. It's because of your generosity that we're able to partner with groups like this and make godly impacts all over our area. So if you would like to give, there are three ways you can do that. You can give online at compass.church forward slash give. You can give in the Compass app or you can give in the generosity boxes out in the lobby after service. Well, welcome to Compass Northwestern Hills. Good morning. Our mission is navigating people to God. We're one church with multiple locations. My name is Rachel Moppin. I'm a volunteer here, and I'm so excited y'all are joining us here today. If you are new here, there should have been a Connect card on your seat when you came in. If y'all could fill that out and bring that to the new here table out in the lobby after service, we'd love to just get to meet y'all, say hello, and give you a little gift as our welcome in. Also, if you're new here or if you've been attending for a while and you're looking for a better way to get plugged in, we have Starting Point. It's every Sunday during the 11 o'clock service through those back doors up into the terrace. So if you want to find out more about Compass or you want to get plugged in, you fully have my permission to leave right now and go up there. It is a great way to find out more about Compass. So there are two really important announcements I have today. The first one is the men's gathering. It's today at Northfield Park from 4 to 6. All the men of Compass Center 8 should be there, hopefully, or you're all going to be there. And it's just a great way to hang out, get to meet all the men. Um, they're going to be grilling. I don't really know what else they're going to be doing, but they're going to be having fun. So y'all should go. The second thing is summer camp. Summer camp is super near and dear to my heart, okay, because I love all of our high school babies out there and our middle school babies. So we have summer camps from kindergarten all the way to seniors. Summer camp is a great way for our students to grow closer in community with each other, for them to grow closer to God. So if you have a student and you would like to sign them up for summer camp, you can do that at compass.church forward slash camps. And we have early bird, early bird, wow, sorry, I can't talk. We have an early bird discounts for summer camps going on through April 16th. So it's only two more days. So if you'd like a little bit of a discount, I'd strongly encourage y'all go home tonight, go home tomorrow and sign up for summer camp. The second really important thing is Windshape. Windshape is our elementary camp, and we need volunteers. We need help. If you want to pack lunches, you want to do check-in, you want to lead a small group, you can help just two mornings. You can help for a whole day. You can help all five days, whatever it is. We would love your help. So if you're in high school, you can actually volunteer at Windshape. It's a great way to get service hours. I promise you we'll sign them off. And if you're not in high school, you want to just give back to our younger generation, we would love to have you. You can also sign up for that at compass.church forward slash camps. And today we're going to be continuing in our message creatures of habit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Compass NRH. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. My name is Laura Collins. I'm part of our teaching team here. And I'm so excited because we are here to continue in this series, like Rachel just said, called Creatures of Habit. 
Now, if you're a guest with us today, maybe this is your first or second time here, I'm so glad that you're here with us for this series. And I just want to invite you to join us in the lobby after service. We actually have the books that we've based this series on available to you if you're a guest, so please join us. We'd love to help you get that, and then also just meet you and answer any questions you might have. And I do just want to confess that all throughout this series, I've accidentally been calling it the Critters of Habit. Uh, <laughs> and I almost just said it then again. So I was like, I just need to get it out there in case it comes out of my mouth. Critters. That's like the Texas edition of what we're doing right now. We're all just a bunch of critters of habit. Now, I don't know about you, but I really and truly am a creature or critter of habit. Like, there are things I do in my life repetitively over and over again. Like, I like the same restaurants. I get the same meal. I am not trying to go out and try something that I wouldn't like. Like, it holds no interest for me. I like to do the same hobbies. I like to do the same activities. Like, is anyone with me? Are you a creature of habit? You like the same things? Right. We all get falling into this kind of trap of habitual motions, right? And some are great. There are great habits we could have. And then there are others that maybe are not so great. And regardless of if they're good or bad, for better or for worse, these habits start to form the story of our lives. I want to give you an example. Like, have you ever been at work and there was a coworker there and someone asked you, like, oh, what's she like? And you'd be like, you know, she's nice, but she is like a bit of a complainer, you know? And you're like, oh, okay. So that habit is now forming the story of how we see that woman. Okay. Or maybe you have a neighbor and someone would be like, oh, do you like your neighbors? You'd be like, yeah, they're good neighbors, but like, okay, don't tell them anything because, like, they will tell the whole block. And you're like, okay. Now the habit of gossip has become your entire identity, right? Now, for better or for worse, our habits can tell our story. But the good news is, is that we are not bound to these stories. We can change the story of our lives. And so that's what we're here to do is to renew our habits and rewrite the stories of our lives. And the good news is we have help in doing this work. I want to point you to Galatians chapter 5. This is a great verse for this series where Paul gives this wisdom. He says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So there is help for us. The Holy Spirit is here to be our guide, to help us live a better and more fruitful and good life. So that's what we're here to talk about. And today we get to talk about the habit that I wrestle with all of the time. I both love it and wrestle with it. It's the habit of prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Now, it's a big, long word for this very simple idea. It's the habit of a life without prayer. The habit of a life without prayer. Now, maybe as you hear that, you're like, okay, on the list of bad habits, like prayerlessness is not the one I'm worried about. You're like, okay, there's way other habits I'd much rather deal with than deal with that one. And that's totally fair. Like, it may be confusing to you that this would even be on a list of bad habits, but I believe that we were not designed to live a prayerless life, but we were designed to live a life full of prayer, full of prayer. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I do want to say it would be a huge miss if we did a whole sermon on prayer and we didn't start the sermon with prayer. So we're going to pray first and we'll get into our message. So would you join me? God, we just are so thankful for you. We're thankful for this day and this time that we have together. And so, Holy Spirit, I invite your presence to be here with us. Would you fill this room? Would you speak uniquely to every single one of us? Would you be our comforter, our counselor, our gentle convictor? Would you speak truth and knowledge and wisdom to us? Would you point out anything in us that needs to grow or any bad habits that need to be cast aside so good habits could come? Holy Spirit, we just invite you to do the work. And Jesus, we're so thankful for you. We're here to bring your name glory, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, I want to read a quote to you that I first found a little off-putting, so I want to get your take on it as well. Pastor F.B. Meyer once said, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. The greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. I want you to consider that quote for a moment. Do you agree with that? Because there are times in our lives where God feels silent, where we've prayed and prayed and prayed and we get no answer. But is it more tragic in our lives that we would never even offer up a prayer to begin with than to live a life where there's unanswered prayer? Now, I think a lot of us have various opinions on prayer. I want you to consider for a moment, what's my honest opinion of prayer? What is it? 
I think there are some of us in here where you have a deep and rich prayer life, and you have the kind of prayer life that I look up to and I aspire to achieve. And so maybe for you, prayer is just a part of your life, and you love prayer, and that's amazing. That's a wonderful place to be. And there may be others of us who we're okay with prayer. Like prayer is good. We acknowledge that it's good, and we will certainly pray before meals, or we'll definitely pray if there's a tragedy. Like we love to write out thoughts and prayers on Facebook. Like we're in it for that, right? And if that's you, like that's a great place to start. It's a great place to be. Maybe for you, you're unsure of prayer. You're like, you know, I've been burned in the past by prayer, so I don't really have much interest in it. And if that's you, I completely understand, and I'm so glad that you're here. And then maybe others of us, we just want nothing to do with it or have never even tried. We're just like, prayer is not for me. It's too much. I don't understand it. It's confusing. And if that's you, again, I completely understand. I've been there. I'm with you. And I'm so glad that you're here today. So regardless of your current views of prayer, I want us again to go back to that quote and remember that the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. When you think through your life and the prayer requests you have right now or the things that are burdening you, the greater tragedy is not to not receive an answer, but is to never offer it to God in the first place. And so perhaps we need to first address, like, why do we need to pray? Why does the Bible talk about prayer all the time? Why does it matter? And we see it all throughout scriptures. Like in the Old Testament, in the very f- first book of Genesis, there's prayer. It goes all throughout the Old Testament. We see it in the Gospels. We see it in the New Testament. We actually can read about the ways that Jesus had a habit of prayer. Luke 5 has just one quick verse of so many that talk about Jesus' prayer life. It says, but often Jesus withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. So you see that? He's often going away, praying alone, seeking God's voice, praying and pouring out his heart to him. Jesus had a habit of prayer. And then Paul, he would take it even further when he wrote to the churches. Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians. He gives us a very easy task. He just says, hey, just pray without ceasing. Like, never stop praying. Anyone just, like, never stop praying? You're just like, I'm praying right now. I've been praying this whole time. I prayed when I woke up this morning. I pray in my dreams. I never stop. Really achievable. Thanks, Paul. But the Bible's really clear. Like, you are people of prayer. We are supposed to pray. The Bible makes a very strong stance on this. And, you know, for me, when I started my journey in prayer, I'd read these verses, and I had people in my life telling me, prayer is amazing, it's so good. And I was like, okay, I believe you. But there still came a moment where I had to step into my own journey of prayer and start to wade through some of the mystery that surrounds prayer. Because for better or for worse, like, prayer has some mystery around it. We don't know all the details of why prayer works. We don't know all the details of why God answers some prayers and doesn't answer others. And maybe for you, you have questions similar to the ones that I had of, like, well, if God's the creator of the universe, like, why do I have to pray? Like, if he knows everything, he can do everything, he's everywhere, why does he need me to pray? And we could do an entire separate sermon just on those questions alone. But with the time we have, just one quick answer for you that really helped me was simply this truth that God has invited humans into the work that he wants to do here on earth. Like, he wants us to co-labor with him in the work that's done here on earth. We saw it in Genesis. God creates Adam and Eve, and he tells Adam, you are going to take care of the earth. And so one of the ways that we take care of the earth is through partnering with God in prayer. It's how we stay connected to the power of Jesus, the power of God, and see his will done here on earth. It's through prayer. And I think there's another really incredible statement that once brought me to my knees that I want to introduce to you as well. When we think about the power of God, it's simply this, that a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be powerless. I don't want to walk through my life a victim to the world around me. Uneasy, uncertain, unsteady. Like, No, I want the power of Christ on my side. And the way we get access to that power is through Jesus. We talked about this a few weeks ago in our I Am series. We learned that Jesus said, I am the vine. So we need to stay connected to the vine, the source of our power. Prayer is a lifeline, and when we don't pray, we can easily fall into disobedience. We can start walking down the right, wrong paths. We can start to interrupt our spiritual lives, and so this prayer is the way we connect to Jesus. 
But prayer is a journey. It's not a one-time thing. It's not we do it for a season and then we're done. It's a lifetime experience. Now, I've been having my own journey with prayer, but then I've had another journey recently that is hilariously parallel to prayer, and it's a journey of weightlifting, which is funny because, like, I've never lifted weights in my entire life. <laughs> like, I learned this. Like, there's a proper way to squat. Did y'all know this? I thought we just did it, but no, there's, like, a, a wrong and a right, and I've been learning that this past year. And I started this journey because a friend of mine was like, hey, do you want to come to my weightlifting training with me? And I was like, oh, sure, like, I'll try it. And the reason I tried it in full transparency, it's not because I valued working out. I did not. It's not because I valued strength. I did not. But it's because my friends were telling me it was good for me. And they're like, oh, it's good for your joints. When you get older, you'll be so thankful, like, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll go. So that first session where I went, y'all have never seen a more pathetic human in your entire life. <laughs> I was lifting weights way above what I should have been doing, and I was in a garage in Texas in August. So, oh, I know, the, just, oh, the collective sympathy for me, I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> I was on the floor sweating, and my poor trainer's like feeding me electrolytes, like revive, revive, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I, it's honestly a miracle I came back after that day. But I did. I came back the second day, and I surely did not lift nearly as heavy as I did. And I tried a little bit, and then I came back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And before you knew it, like, I love this thing. Like, I get why people lift weights. I get why they work out. It's so fine. And I love how I feel after, and I'm getting stronger, and I can see that the weights are going up, and there's always a new challenge. Like, I'm never going to get to a point where I've maxed out. Like, that's incredible to me. And what I've learned is like what working out was once an obligation, now I find it as a resource. And prayer has been the exact same way for me. It started out for me where I did it because people told me I had to. Like if we could be honest. I was like, prayer is good for you, it's in the Bible. Pastors get on stage and they're like, you have to pray. And I was like, but I really don't want to because you're telling me to. That's reality. But then eventually I was like, okay, I'll try, I'll try. And it was hard at first. It felt like wading through mud. I was just like, this is just not interesting to me at all. Like, what am I doing? Who am I talking to? What is happening? But then I just kept going a little bit at a time. And before you know it, you fall in love with it. And I fell in love with prayer. And I value prayer now so highly in my life. Like, it is in the top things that I must do every day. I love it. And so it's my hope that for all of us that we can start to transition prayer from seeing it as an obligation to a resource. Prayer is a resource. It is not an obligation. It's not a chore or a task to be checked off a list. It's a resource that you and I get access to. Like, we have the gift of prayer. It is a gift that we get to talk to God through prayer. So my hope is that we can make that transition for some of us who may see it as an obligation right now, that we might start to see it as a resource. So why don't we pray? I have a few reasons for why I think we don't pray. The first one is that our priorities are misaligned. Like, we don't value it, and that's totally fair. We've got a thousand things going on at any given moment, and we are a distracted people. The worst part of my week happens on Sunday mornings, not because of church, but because I get a notification on my phone that tells me my screen time for the week. And I'm horrified every single time. Like, I'm just so upset about it. It happened last service. I saw it right before I got to preach. And I was like, oh, it's literally here. Like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. We're distracted people. There are a thousand other things that could take priority over prayer. We're talking important things like friends and family, our work. We could be talking about hobbies, working out even, TikTok, Instagram, like social media, movies, entertainment, sleep. Sleep is a huge one that we have to battle against because I want to prioritize sleep above prayer, but I have to learn to flip that and put prayer back above all of these things. They're not bad things. They're just things that we might be valuing above prayer. Now, the second reason that we might not pray is that we have independent spirits. Now, this is for all my firstborn kids out here, like me, because I don't like being told what to do. I do not like it. In fact, I had this conversation many times this week where someone's like, you should watch this movie. And I'm like, ooh, bad mistake. I won't do it now. <laughs> I won't do it. You know why? Because you told me to. And I don't want to. I won't, you can't tell me what to do. Right? We have independent spirits. We're like, I'm not going to be told what to do. And if I pray, then I'm going to be praying to God, and he's going to tell me to do something, and I'm not going to want to do it. 
And maybe some of you are in that spot. Like, you know that God has called you to start something new, maybe a new job or a new nonprofit or a ministry. And you're like, I don't want to pray about it because I don't want to do it. Or maybe God's inviting you to do something hard, like forgive someone, release bitterness and anger towards someone. And that's hard work. And you're like, I don't want to do it. So I don't want to hear from God that he wants me to forgive them because that's hard. We have independent spirits and that might keep us from praying. Another thing is we might be afraid that we're doing it wrong. Like we may think that there is a proper way to pray. And this is for all my perfectionists out here. We're like, no, there must be a system and a formula, and I must say these exact words in this exact order, and if I don't say them in that order, then God's like, ooh, wrong password. You do not get answers, and we're like, dang it, I tried. Right? We're like, there must be a correct way to do this, and so because we're not entirely sure about that or we fear being imperfect or getting it wrong, we're like, I just won't pray altogether. If I can't figure it out, if I don't know all the details, like I'm just not even going to try. That could be a reason for prayer. Now, another reason is we could be resentful or disappointed because of past experiences with prayer. Now, maybe if you're like me, you've had something that you've been bringing to God for years, and he's not answering you, and you're disappointed by that. Like, I understand that completely. Maybe for you, you prayed and prayed and prayed for healing, and then at the end of the day, still ended up at a funeral. And you're like, God, where were you in that? Or maybe you prayed and prayed and prayed for your marriage, and at the end of the day, divorce papers were signed. And you're like, God, where are you in that? Why wouldn't you answer me in that? And so because of that, there's a resistance, a natural resistance to want to pray after you've been burned like that. Now, maybe for some of us, there's unbelief, and that's what keeps us from praying. And this might encompass almost all of us when it comes to why we don't pray. And I want to differentiate disbelief and unbelief because these words are similar but slightly different disbelief is saying i don't believe in god like i have no belief in god whatsoever but unbelief is saying i've rejected or i doubt the promises of god do you see the difference in those two yes i believe in god but i'm not sure that i believe in his character i don't really believe that he's good I don't believe him when he says he's going to provide for me or care for me or take care of me or love me or forgive me or redeem me. Like, I just don't know. And so we can find ourselves in unbelief, rejecting the promises and the goodness of God. I want to read to you from Mark's account of a father that's approaching Jesus, and he has a demonized son. And he comes to the disciples, and he's asking them to cast this demon out out of his son. And they try, and they try, and they try, and they can't do it. So eventually he brings the son to Jesus because he knows Jesus is a healer. And so this is his conversation with Jesus. He says, have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Now, so often I am like the father in this story. Because I will come to Jesus and I will say, like, I know you exist. I know that you went to the cross, laid in the tomb, resurrected from the dead, went to heaven. Like, I know, I believe that you are real. I believe that you exist. I believe that you have power. I just don't believe you're going to help me. Like, I just don't believe you're going to help my situation or their situation or this problem that I'm facing. Like, I don't believe you're actually going to do the work that you say you're going to do. That's unbelief. It's this moment where we forget the character and the nature of God, and that can lead us into prayerlessness. There's a very wise pastor, a South African pastor named Andrew Murray, and he was a great teacher on prayer, and he had this quote where people came to him and they asked him, what then is the cause of so much prayerlessness? Is it not unbelief? To which he replies, certainly. But then comes the question, what is the cause of that unbelief? What I'm seeing in this quote is that there is a cycle that we can fall into where we pray, but we're not quite getting what we want, and so we fall into unbelief. Like, okay, I don't really believe that God is who he says he is, and because of that unbelief, I'm not going to pray. And because I'm not praying, I'm in unbelief. And because there's unbelief, I'm not going to pray. Are you seeing the cycle here? And we can fall into this habit of prayerlessness because of this cycle of unbelief. So we need to break off this cycle 
We need to step away from it because when we get caught in this cycle, we can get tempted into sin. We can get tempted down the wrong path. We can find ourselves believing the lies of the world instead of the truth of Jesus, the one who is the maker of all truth, of all knowledge, of all wisdom. And we can start to forget his promises. We can forget that he is our defender, that he is good, that he is powerful, that he does care for us. But when we pray, we're near him. We're in relationship with him. We remember his character. We remember his truth over the lies of the enemy. And then, you know, there's this old phrase that I think is absolutely terrible, but you're maybe familiar with it, which is absence makes the heart grow fonder. You familiar with that? It's like the phrase we tell high school students when they're going to college, and they're like, oh, you're a boyfriend, and you will definitely stay together. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. And you're like, oh, okay, maybe. Right? It's a terrible phrase. You know what actually makes the heart grow fonder? Communication. Active relationship. One-on-one time together. That's what makes your heart grow fonder and deeper in love with Jesus. It's what keeps us connected to him. It keeps us hearing his voice and his truth. Imagine your friendships. You may go six months without talking to your friend, and you come back and you have a conversation with them. What's that conversation going to be like? Like, hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Like, how have the last six months been? You're like, oh, uh, fine, I guess. Like, are you not going to go into the details of life in that time? You might. There might be a little shallow of a conversation. Maybe you think about your spouse. And you're like, hey, honey, I'm going to talk to you once a week. I hope that's cool. I'll see you next time. Like, we get one time a week together, and then the rest, I'll, I won't be talking to you. Like, good to see you. That would be a terrible marriage, right? Because where there's no communication, there's no relationship. And that's a really hard truth to hear, but it's true about prayer as well. Where there is no communication with God, there is no relationship. It's very one-sided at that point. And we want the relationship with God that Jesus had, where he's talking to him, where he's hearing from him, where he's walking in his will and doing incredible works here on earth. So you and I, you know, we're human, and we are naturally going to be bent towards sin. Like, we have to fight to be like Jesus. But prayer can help us with that. The pastor, John Bunyan, once said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, as sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Again, we get caught up in that cycle. If I pray, then I'm not in sin. But if I don't pray, I'm in sin. And we can find ourselves trapped back there. So how do we break that cycle? How do we break this habit of prayerlessness? And I'm really glad we're actually talking about this habit early on in this series, because this is the habit that I believe can help you change all other habits in your life. Prayer is a resource. It's not an obligation. So how do we break this habit of prayerlessness? The first thing we can do is simply acknowledge our habit, like acknowledge where you are right now. Do you have a thriving prayer life? Amazing, fantastic. What I want to encourage you with then is start to think about how God wants to teach you next. Like let's not settle in where we are and assume we've learned all there is about prayer. What does he want to do next? He's always doing a new thing. So where is he going to push you and pull you and drive you into a new and deeper relationship with him in prayer? Start to consider that question. For others, like maybe we have absolutely no relationship with prayer. Like that's fine, but we need to acknowledge it. Acknowledge where we are right now and invite the Holy Spirit to do the work with us. We can ask him to help us form new habits. Now, the second thing we can do is identify our obstacles. What's currently keeping you from praying? Is it distractions? If it is, like you and literally everyone else, like we are distracted people. So what can you do to remove distractions? Or maybe for you, it is feeling burned out by prayer. So maybe we need to identify that. Or maybe you're just in a dry season where you're like, I just don't have the motivation. Like, what is the obstacle? And let's identify it. Let's name it and call it to light. Now, the third thing we can do is schedule time to pray. Now, this is important because it's a discipline to pray. Like, it's not something that just happens to us. It's not something we just fall into. It takes effort to pray. It's why we call them spiritual disciplines. In the way, it's a discipline to sleep well and eat well and work out and have good and deep friendships. Like, it's a discipline we have to develop over time. But we have to learn to prioritize it. And there's an incredible quote that I want to read to you from the abbot John Chapman. He says this, pray as you can, not as you can't. Now, I love this phrase because what he's saying here is like, hey, pray where you are right now in this moment. 
don't pray as you want to pray in the future that's unachievable, perhaps unrealistic, and could start to heap shame on us. We're like, well, I can't pray for an hour every day, so I shouldn't even try. Like, that's a lie from the enemy. Pray as you can. Where in your life can you pray? Is it waking up 15 minutes early? Please do that. What a fantastic way to start a habit of prayer. Is it praying on a drive to work or to school? Like, that's a fantastic time to pray. Pray how you can, not how you can't. For me, I started doing something called habit stacking. That was really helpful, and this is something that comes from, like, self-help books, but I'm going to apply it to prayer here. Habit stacking is saying, I have a really good habit I want to start, but I don't really have the motivation to do it, so I'm going to stack it on top of habits that already exist. So for me, I drink coffee every single morning. It does not matter if I had a great night of sleep or a terrible night of sleep. I'm drinking coffee in the morning. Like, it's a lifeline for me. So I'm going to stack prayer on that habit. Every morning when I drink my coffee, I will pray. Like, what an easy way to stack that habit. I have friends who stack prayer on top of brushing their teeth because we're all brushing our teeth twice a day, right? We're all doing that? Great. Just checking. This has been a friendly dentist reminder. We're all brushing our teeth twice a day. Imagine if you were just praying as you brush your teeth. Well, there's two minutes worth of prayer at the beginning and end of your day. Fantastic. What a great way to start and develop this habit of prayer. It could be on your drive to or from school pickup, drop off, work, the gym, like wherever you're finding space, the habits in your lives, try adding prayer there and just see what happens. Take a little step. It doesn't have to be a huge step that we're taking. There's a great habit stacking tool that's been used by Christians for centuries, which is to pair uh, meals with prayer, because we're going to eat every day, right? There are very few days where we're like, you know what? I've decided I don't need food anymore. Like, no, we're going to eat. We're going to eat every day. So what if you stacked your prayer on top of your meals? There's a formula that's been used for centuries I want to introduce to you. It's to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner arranged around prayer. So the Lord's Prayer at breakfast. We're going to walk through details about what this could look like in a moment. But then intercession at noon, at lunch, this is a great way to pray for people. I once heard a lady say, like, she didn't have time to do these big, long prayers at lunch. But what she would do is she just had a list of names in her phone of people she was praying for. And she would simply read that list aloud and, like, offer it to the Lord at lunch. Just be like, please see these people. Please meet with them. Every single name on that list ended up being baptized. Simple prayers, but powerful prayers, because we're connected to the one with all the power when we do that. And then for dinner, you could practice thanksgiving, which is simply saying thank you to God for all the ways you saw him move over the past day. Thank you for the meal I'm eating. Thank you for the company. Thank you for the house I'm in. Like, say thank you for what he's done. These are easy rhythms that we can add into our prayer life. Now, the fourth thing we can do is we can pray with others. There are sometimes prayers that need other people around them. Have you ever had that sense where you're praying and you're like, I can't get a breakthrough, or I am so distracted, like I can't even begin to pray, or I'm so weighed down by this, like I don't want to pray. That may be a great indicator that you need to bring other people in to pray with you. There have been times in my life where I have felt so heavy that I just had to text friends and be like, please pray for me. And sometimes they've even shown up at my door and prayed with me in my dining room. Just like, let's pray together. We need the community of Christ around us. There's a great verse on this that I will always go back to if I ever forget. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Praying in groups, we will not be easily broken. Now, the fifth thing we can do is we can use an outline. I want to be clear. There is no shame in the outline game. Like, if you need an outline, you are in the vast majority. Like, I need one too. And Jesus gave us an outline. Remember, we should pray how we can, not how we can't. If you're unsure how to pray, use an outline. This is a great tool. And Jesus gave us one in Matthew chapter 6. And I want us to maybe read this out loud together. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And let's read this together. It says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, if you're just starting to pray, this is a fantastic thing to just pray out loud. Just as you get your feet wet, as you're getting started in this journey, pray this out loud. That's wonderful. 
But if you're ready to dive deeper into this, you can actually use this as a template and break it down into sections. So what I'll do sometimes is in the mornings, I'll pray, our Father in heaven, thank you, God, that you're my father. I will start to just thank him for the ways I've seen him be a father in my life. Or I'll remind myself of the ways he's a father. Thank you for taking care of me, for providing for me. Thank you for defending me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being the one who sees me when I wake up in the morning and takes care of me when I go to sleep. Like, thank you. You are such a good father. And then the next one, hallowed be your name. I will remind myself, God is so holy. I'll just take a moment to celebrate his holiness. Like we sang that song together, holy forever. Maybe just worship for a moment and just say, thank you, God, for your holiness. When I remember his holiness, I'm less self-absorbed in those moments and my eyes are firmly locked on him. And whatever happens around me isn't really going to impact me nearly as much because I know how holy God is, how good he is in his character. When it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, at that moment, I'm asking God for his will to be done in my life, in my family, in my friends, for our church, for NRH, for our community. Like, I'm asking for his will to come. And then give us this day our daily bread. I'm asking him to give me what I need. So I will then take requests to him. Be like, will you please help me with this? Or, you know what, this person does need healing. God, would you heal them? God, would you give me what I need? Provide for me the resources, the finances, the gifts, the talents, whatever you need in that moment. Forgive us our debts. That's where I'm asking for forgiveness for the ways that I've sinned. It could be things I've said, things I've thought, things I've done. I'm asking for forgiveness. And then I'm forgiving those who I'm holding some grudges against. So I may just sit for a moment and be like, who am I bitter towards right now? And you'd be amazed at the names that come up. You're like, oh, I didn't know I was bitter towards them. Okay. And I'll just ask God to help me release them, forgive them, and then bless them to go in freedom, to not be bound by my bitterness and my anger. And then finally, I will just ask for the Lord to protect me, protect me, my family. Again, I will pray protection around this church, all of you, like, we're asking God to do his will here on earth to protect us, to be with us. So this is a great outline. But to be totally honest, like it took me a long time to work up to that kind of detailed prayer. And before I got anywhere near there, there was a simple four-step prayer that I was doing called the Acts Prayer. If you've never done this, this is a great tool to remember how to pray. It's simply adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So again, we're adoring God for his holiness. We're adoring his creation. We're confessing where we've sinned. We're being thankful for the ways that he's helped us and been with us. And then supplication is just bringing requests to God. That's, again, those pieces of, like, God, I need healing. I need help. I need, I need peace. Whatever it is that we need, we're bringing that to God. And here's the thing. Before I ever did that, I did something even simpler, which is that I simply read the Psalms aloud. There are 150 Psalms. So you can read one a day, and that would take you 150 days to learn how to pray. And let's be totally real. When I started this, it did not take me 150 days. It took me more like 200 days because I was just like all over the place. I would forget. I would completely miss a day. I'd miss two days. I'd be cramming in and at night right before I went to bed. But it's the consistency that matters. We're developing a habit. We're building endurance towards prayer. And the way we build endurance in any habit, working out, our work life, our family, our friends, it takes discipline. And we're just trying to get ourselves into that movement. So no matter where you find yourself on the prayer spectrum, like I hope you're finding a place to start, a place to dive deeper, a place to refresh your soul in all of this. And the last way that we can pray is we can pray with boldness. What we know is true is God wants us to pray bold prayers. He says in John 14 that we can ask for anything in Jesus' name, and he will do it so that the Father will have the glory. That's a bold thing to say, and there are bold prayers he wants us to pray. But we can be hesitant to pray bold prayers for all of the reasons we've listed before. But I want to encourage you to step out in faith and simply try. Remember that it is worse to have unoffered prayers than unanswered prayers. That our lives could be radically changed if we would just offer these prayers to God in boldness and in faith. And that we can be powerful Christians. That this could be a church that's known as its identity of being a church of prayer. Like when people in the community need prayer, they'd be like, oh, you've got to go to Compass NRH. Because I promise you they're going to pray for you. That's my hope and my dream and my prayer for our church. That we would be that church at all of our campuses that we would boldly approach the throne of God in prayer. And I want to give us an opportunity to practice this right now. 
So I just want to encourage you, all of us, whether you love prayer or are suspicious of prayer, wherever you may find yourself, would you just close your eyes for a moment? For my independent people in the room who don't want to, I'm with you. This isn't for any super spiritual reason. It's mostly just so that you can concentrate, so that we're going to block out the distractions that keep us from hearing God's voice. And so you're not looking at me being like, what's she doing? What's she thinking? Why is she wearing that? This is time between you and God. And I just want you to first acknowledge where you are in prayer right now. Just say it to him. This is what I think about prayer, the good, the bad, the ugly. Say it all. If you find yourself in disbelief or unbelief, would you just tell him? Just say it. Don't be polished. Don't be perfect. Don't try to put on a King James voice. Just in your own voice, in your own language. Tell him these things. If you want help starting prayer for the first time, would you just tell him that right now? Just ask him for help. If your prayer life is feeling really dry right now, and apathy has started to set in, would you just confess that to him? Ask him to renew your spirit. If there's a burden that you have that you need to place before God, something you've never brought to him in prayer, would you be bold enough to bring that to him right now? If you have something you need to confess, a sin that's really weighing on your shoulders, would you just confess it to him now? And then I want to remind you to ask him for forgiveness because he does want to forgive you. And he's faithful and just to do so. And then finally, if you have an unanswered prayer request that you've been bringing to God for a long time and you're tired of bringing it to him, can you bring it to him one more time? And if you need prayer after this, if this is the kind of prayer that needs people around it, would you find me in the lobby? Because I would love to pray with you. And so Jesus, we just thank you so much that we get to pray. We thank you that you have not left us powerless, but you have given us a powerful resource of prayer. We thank you that you see us and you know us. We thank you that you take these burdens off of our shoulders. So we are giving you these burdens, Jesus, in your name. Would you carry them away from us? And would you give us your easy and light burden instead? We ask for your Holy Spirit to give motivation towards prayer, that you would refresh weary and dry souls, that you would do a new thing here at Compass, that you would do a new thing in our lives, and that this would be a church marked by its prayer that that would be the story of compass. And we believe that you want to do it, God. So Jesus, we bring all of these things in your name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for, yeah, give it up. Let's have a little clap. That's nice. (laughs) We're so thankful for Laura for joining us here today and just her incredible message. Don't forget, if you're new here, we really, really, truly would love to meet y'all. So join us out in the lobby at the new here table. If you have a student, sign them up for summer camps. And most importantly, I just got word we're actually having more baptisms. So I would love for y'all to come celebrate our new brothers and sisters in Christ. So head out those doors and watch our baptism. And we will see y'all next week for our sermon series.